we're talking a bit about it's where you left it at. Because the reality is things tend to be where you left them. All right. So, so wherever you leave things in 2020 is going to be where you have to pick them up in 2021. Now, I'm not talking about things like your car keys. Okay, odds are the kids are going to play with it. It's going to go missing. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about your relationships. I'm talking about your commitments. I'm talking about your finances. These things are going to be where you leave them. And last week we spent quite a bit of time, we looked at David and how he made preparations for his son Solomon for the next age to come in the history of Israel. And he said, well, I need to put them off in the best way I possibly can. And that is so important for us at the end of this year, the end of 2020. We've still got a few days to make sure we set off the best way we possibly can. And from there, we went to, to Paul writing in Ephesians 5.15. We're going to read that. And it says, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. So this is where we kind of, the, the main idea is we want to live like the wise. We want to think before we act. You know, we want to make sure that we don't just act out of craziness. We want to make the most of every opportunity that we might find. And we want to know what God wants us to do. And I spoke about this. I'm not re-preaching my message of last week. Go listen to it. Okay, it's a good message. You need to hear it. And that's kind of the idea of where we're setting up ourselves. Because what I want us to do is I want us to set ourselves up for success. Now, this might sound to you like a, a, a prosperity type gospel, but the Bible is clear with, with certain ways that we should live, and, and many of them have the promise of blessing attached to them. So we would be silly to think there aren't, you know, things that we could apply in our lives that God said, well, if you do this, you will be blessed. This is strategic setups for success. And that's what we're talking about these two weeks. How can we set ourselves up for success? I have to apologize. I promise that we're going to look at, uh, you know, in faith, family, finances, and friends. But there's no time for friends. So no time for friends in 2021. Okay, so write that off. Um, I, I wish I could preach it next week as well, but then it's too late. Okay, then it's, we're, you have to be set up already. So obviously that means God doesn't want you to have friends. Done. I'm joking. Um, Absolutely joking. <laughs> I'll talk about friends still in the future. Don't worry. The only area we covered last week was faith. And, and we read out of Jeremiah 17, 7, where it says, Blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. That's the starting point. That's the starting point. You have that foundation right. You get that thing in place. You make sure that your hope is not in a, in a 2021 that's full of vaccines or, or a miracle healing balm for, for COVID. If you make sure your hope is in something that you can actually anchor your life into, you're setting yourself up for success. You're setting yourself up. But if your anchor for 2021 is in a good stock market, you are already being washed away. If your anchor is that things won't be tough at work or that your wife will be nicer to you. My wife is always nice. I feel like I need to clarify that came off weird. That everything is going to be rosy. I'm here to give you bad news for 2021. <laughs> it's going to have challenges. Do not root yourself and things that cannot sustain you. Let's get ourselves into today. We're setting ourselves up for success by finishing well. We're busy with some renovations at home. Um, who loves renovations? I kind of do, to be quite honest. I actually really, and I really quite enjoy it. Um, well, some things more than others, right? There's, there's always jobs that like, oh, this is fun. Um, and, and there's that one job every six years that you do that nothing goes wrong. And that is the best job. You know, you might be servicing your car or something like that. I did the other day. It was going sweet um, because the, the X-Trail we drive services so easily. Like, it is so calm. It's nice and high, so you don't strain your back. It's like three screws, and that's it. And then I got to the oil filter. That was my desert. All right, that was, that was my 2020. I was fine until I got to the, to the oil filter. 
But sometimes we get tired. You know, I was busy the other night and I got tired, you know, because it was late. It was like 12 o'clock and I was just, I was over it for the day. So I left it and I went to bed. And I woke up the next morning wishing I just put another five minutes into it. Wishing that I, could I not have just put my tools away that I'm now falling over? Because now what had to happen this next morning is I had to spend a lot more time finishing what I didn't set up right the previous night. Especially if you're painting. Don't leave paint brushes. It's never a good idea. No matter how tired you are, you are setting yourself up for failure in the future. And I realized that as I did this is the, the best thing I can do is to make sure I don't leave things the wrong way. It's to make sure that even if it takes a little bit of effort, this last push, that last five minutes before you just fall into your bed and go into a semi-coma for a couple of hours, those last five minutes, those last five days you have, push. Leave these things right. Because what you don't do in this next couple of days, you have to do in January. Because they're not going to fix themselves. So today we're going to look at two principles only, or two areas. We're going to look at family and finances. That's all I want to look at today, um, because that's really all we have time for, because it's already a lot of territory to cover. Um, So if you're taking notes, you better better do it uh, as quickly as you can. Um, And remember, I'm not trying to do a a massive exposition on every step of everything. I'm trusting God for simple things we can put in place, simple things that you can actually do in these next couple of days to set yourself up for success. So how do we set ourselves up for success in family? How do we do it? What is the key principle that we can put into place? And I want to make sure we make it as simple as I possibly can make it a priority. And you think, Hein, obviously. But I don't see it as obvious when I look at the world. You know, you know what I see when I look at the world and I look at families? I see it as third, fourth, fifth in line. I see it coming in after work, after hobbies, I see it coming in after golf, after cycling, after fitness, after all these things. And what I mean is, is if we take the 168 odd hours that that a week is, if we look back at our week, you know, would we be able to say, my family was a priority to me. I made my family a priority this week. Because if we look at our week, at those hours that we spent, and we cannot say, it is evident that, well, God is number one in my life, and it is evident that my family is number two in my life, well, well, then there's an issue. Because what you're doing is, because these priorities aren't set right in your life, you've set yourself up for failure. Because when those things are not right, I'm telling you now, everything is going to fall apart. Everything is going to fall apart. Simple. Do we prioritize our families? And to understand what priority means, I want us to quickly just look at Ephesians 5.25. We know this so well. No, this is not a marriage seminar, but it says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Now, this whole part of Ephesians, uh, Paul is writing on marriage and relationships and children. It's really brilliant, and we'll definitely preach it sometime. But, but what Paul is saying is not necessarily just the commitment of a husband to a wife, but how important, what a priority family should be. Because he doesn't say, love your wives and also your job to the point of dying for it. He doesn't say that. What he's saying is your family should be such a priority that you are willing to give everything. Because Jesus didn't just die. He gave his entire life for the church. We think that commitment is shown in sacrifice. Actually, not always. Sometimes commitment is shown in a simple amount of time, a quick conversation, a cup of coffee. So, Paul writing here, he's saying, this is, this is the kind of commitment I want you to have. This is the kind of priority that your family should be, that your wife should be, that your husband should be. But this brings us to an interesting area in family because while there are you know, lists of priorities in our lives, and when we come to family, it is no different. And I need to say this. This is so important because if we get this wrong, because if I just say family, you say, yo, hon, but I love my kids very much. Yeah, but when last did you make a cup of tea for your wife? 
Because even within family, there are priorities that if we get it wrong, it's going to start falling apart. Even in family, there are priorities that we have to set in place because if we don't, we are building the roof before we build the walls and it's going to fall apart. So what does these priority lists look like? What, what do we do? Well, first of all, and I have to say this even within family, if God is not first, everything's going to fail. You cannot build a marriage if it's not built on the rock of God. He is the anchor in our marriages, and I want to make this very clear. Again, this is not a marriage seminar, but when we get married, we don't go into a partnership between us and our wives or us and our husbands. We go into a partnership between us, our wives or husbands, and God. This is what a true marriage vow is. It is saying before God, we want you a part of it. It is so interesting that a cord of three strands isn't easily broken when the Bible speaks of two together. Two together and all of a sudden there's a third and if you miss the third, the two strands will break. Time and time again. So if him, if he is not a priority, if it's not him, if it's not his word, if it's not his church, you know, if these things aren't right in your life, your priority list is already wrong and you're setting yourself up for failure. Number two, very important, on our priority list, your spouse. If you're married, your spouse comes before your children. Done. This is not a conversation we're having because I'm the only one with a microphone right now. This is how it is. Your spouse comes before your children every single time. Listen, it is a statistical fact that if spouses, if a husband and a wife work together in a healthy household, it gives the children a statistical advantage in life. It is something you cannot deny. It is everywhere that you see when father and mother are there, and especially actually if they just attend. They don't even have to be Christians. It just says if they attend a religious gathering, they are more likely to have successful children. Because what is happening is the blessings of the forefathers will start running over into their children. What you're doing is you're investing blessings, blessings for your kids. Talk about a, an investment return. This is statistical fact. The world is seeing what God has instated. Your spouse comes first. Be careful not to just be mommy and daddy, but to be husband and wife. If you're mommy and daddy all the time and never, never a husband and wife, what you're actually doing is you're hurting your children. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be that straight. And it's a season. It's the season we're in. You know, there will be a season again, you know, that there will be time for husband and wife. Time is never found. I've never found time. You never walk down the street and go, oh, you know, a handful of time. This is nice. No, you make time. Time is not found. It is made. And even though there are seasons of maybe a bit less and more time that's available for us to make time for our spouses, if you neglect making time, even while you have a, a two-year-old and a nine-month-old in the house, while well, you're setting your kids up for failure. Because now it's not just about you and your success for 2021. It is your child's success for his life or her life. Make your spouse pro. I feel like I can put the microphone down. Some of you, that's what you need to hear. You haven't made your spouse a priority. So, God first, spouse. Then comes the kids. Then comes the kids. I love my kids. Ephesians 6 verse 4 says, Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. I just want to give some context here. This is so important. Um, chapter 6 verse 1, so just three verses earlier, it says, Children, obey your parents, not father. In other words, both are instructing. So before you point a finger to your husband and say, yeah, our kids are unbehaved because you didn't do it. Well, no, 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 no. Both are instructing. This was specifically said, I do believe, because mothers are so much more nurturing naturally than fathers. And this is okay. I believe God made us to complement each other, that there should be one that is chest hair and, and one that can hug without scratching the kids with their beards. This is beautiful. This is how God created it. I, I love that. But fathers... Do not neglect that part of your responsibility. Don't stir up anger in your kids. It says rather bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. But you cannot bring them up if you're not around. You can't bring them up if they're not a priority. How are you going to instruct your kids how to live in the Lord if you're not making 
them a priority in your life. And I want you to know something very important. This is not saying that you should speak about how to live in the Lord. No, you should primarily show them how to live in the Lord. Because let me tell you, kids are far more likely to do what you do than to do what you say. I mean, I've learned that with, with youth ministry, with my sister living with us, that they don't pick up your good habits. You know, they, it's like you can say all the right things, but uh, that one mistake you made, is what got, they're going to keep it against you for years. So what we must be way more careful is how do we show them how to live a godly life? What are we going to show them relationships look like? What are we going to teach them in the way that we act that this is what marriage should be? This is how a husband should love and adore his wife. This is how a wife should honor and respect and, woo, here we go, submit to her husband. This is how it should look. This is how we should be devoted to the church, to Jesus. This is what we should do. If you want to set up yourself for success in 2021, get these priorities right. Get it right. Third of all, is, is very important still is relatives. And I say this is important because we're going to read a scripture in just a moment. And it starts with, with direct family. You know, it starts with obviously children, spouse. But then it also, it's, it, the, the important list goes, you know, to your, to your parents, to your siblings, and, and then to the further relatives. And, and I'm going to read one of the the harshest scriptures I've ever read, um, anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Oh my goodness. Huh? So many areas. Paul says, you know, don't do that or, or rather refrain from doing that. How political is this? And here we read in Timothy, in 1 Timothy, and it says, well, if you're not looking after your family, if you're not there for your kids, for your wife, for your husband, if you're not there for your mother, your father, your siblings when they need you, well, then you are worse than an unbeliever and you have denied your faith in Jesus Christ. Ooh, That's rough. I don't want to say this so that we quickly go home and quickly draw out all the cash we can, you know, and give it to our relatives. I want to say that because it is so vitally important to look after people. And there are going to be times in your life where, where you are going to be in the position that you have to look out for others. Because there's times in your life when you're in the positions that others have to look out for you. And I've been on both sides of that coin. Obviously, you know, anyone that's been a teenager will know that food ain't free. Um, but still, you shovel it in, especially us boys, eh? Yes. And I was grateful to have a son. And then I thought, oh, but he's eating when he's a teenager. So I started a separate savings account. No, I'm joking. Um, but it is what we do. It is what we as Christians do. We look out for our families and for one another. I want to get to a, a topic quickly that will empty out the church in just a moment. Um, I want to talk about finances for just 10 minutes before we go home. As I said, three areas setting yourself up for success. First is faith that we covered last week. Today we've spoken quite a bit about family and especially getting your priorities straight within your family. That is how you set yourself up for success. And I want to talk about money, finances. It's usually the last place to get saved. I don't know if you've noticed. You know, we get saved in our hearts and then it takes time to get saved in our minds. And then we get saved in our clothing. You know, we usually dress a bit more modest or whatever. But the pocketbook, it's, it's, uh, I think we should start carrying our pocketbooks here so it's closer to the heart or something. You know, Maybe it'll get saved quicker. But that old statement rings so true. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. When I talk about finances, and I want to give a simple principle about how to be you know, setting yourself up for success in 2021, is be strategic. Plan your finances. Plan it. Even if you have two pennies to rub together, and that's it, make sure you plan where you're going to spend it. 
The other night it was, was bath time, and it's a fun time of the night. I love bath time. And anyway, so, so usually Ron is making sure Will doesn't scale up the wall because that's all he wants to do. He can't walk, but he just wants to climb over everything, and it's slippery. But anyway, and I was pouring water into cups with Abby. You know, that as you do, um, that's the game. But one of her cups has little holes in it at the bottom. So, so you scoop it, and you kind of like pour it just without having to tip anything. And, and, and what it just does is it runs all the time because it has holes in the bottom. And what I realized is that our finances work so similarly. And you would have noticed in your life, finances tend to run. They run into spar, they run into Mr. Price, they run into trouble, they, they run even when you don't have anything to run, they tend to keep running. The only power we have is not to stop the running, I don't think that's possible, is to aim where we want the water to go. Money's going to run, but you're still the one holding the cup. You're still the one holding the cup. You're still the one that has to decide where is this money going to go. You need to budget. If you're thinking, hi, you're preaching about a budget. Yes, I am preaching about a budget because it's not about the budget. It's not about the finances. It's not about how much or about how little you have. It's about stewardship. This is what it's all about. It's not about millions or tens. It is about everything belongs to God. And you're going to be responsible for what God is entrusting to your pocket. David writes in Psalm 24 verse 1, he says, The earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants, belong to the Lord. That is how finances work. It belongs to God. There is no such thing as something you own. It doesn't exist. I'm sorry to give you that bad news. But there is such a thing as something that's been entrusted to you. Something that God has entrusted to your care. The world and everything in it is God's. We just have this opportunity to steward what is entrusting to us. So it's not about how much or little you have. God isn't looking for rich people. He's looking for faithful people. And there are far more faithful people with two cents than what there many times are with billions of cents. I mean, the, the woman that brought that, the lost, her everything that she had. She was richer than all those men standing in their fancy outfits because she was stewarding what God entrusted to her. She was stewarding it well, wow. listen to what David says in 1 Chronicles. Wait, before we go there, just want to give some context. So, so they're getting ready to build the temple. And David just gave so much that we cannot even begin to fathom how much he just gave towards the building. I mean, gold and precious stones and logs. And I mean, he pretty much just emptied out his pockets, basically, for building this temple. And, and when his leaders saw it, as they responded in like. They went and they just gave. And, it, and the Bible counts of how much was given, but it's not not amounts that I can truly understand because it's just too much. I don't know what a ton of gold is worth, you know. Uh, so they just started blessing. And when the people saw the leaders give, oh, if you're not hearing this right now. So David gave, the leaders gave, and the people responded in like, Ooh, there comes the lesson for our church leaders. But uh, anyway, so, so people started just pouring out everything they had. They were like, wait a second, if this is the norm, this is what we're going to do. And David responds, after all this giving, we're reading 1 Chronicles 20. 9, 14, but who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you and we have given you only what comes from your hand. David's like, I didn't do any favors. How, how can I take a pat on the back for giving God what's already his? Who are we? Who are we that you would bless us so much, Lord, that we can give? Each one gave in accordance to what they had, but everyone gave because they were stewarding what God gave well. Everything is His. That gold card in your pocket, some of us are fancy with black cards and little gold trimmings. They got very fancy with the bank cards, eh? I've noticed it's quite pretty. I, I, I don't have one of those. But that's God's. What I want to ask you is, what are you doing with it? What are you doing with it? 
I cannot, I cannot tell you enough how important it is to plan your finances. I know, I only have 20 rand. Well, then make sure you know where the 20 rand is going to go. See, because you're not preparing for the 20 rand, you're preparing for the 20,000. And if God cannot trust you with the 20, how can he ever entrust the 20,000, 200,000, the 2 million to you? I, I, I want to I go into an area that I know is, might ruffle some feathers, and I'm warning you before I go there. But I've said this before. I have certain pastoral responsibilities when I take this microphone. I've got certain things that I would be irresponsible to you in my relationship to you as a pastor if I do not warn you of what the Scripture says. Because there is something that can sink you. And it's something that doesn't just sink you. It's something that sinks those around you. It's something that sinks whole nations. It says in Malachi 3, verse 8 to 18, or to 11, sorry, I believe we we're reading. It says, will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you in tithes and offerings? You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. See, we know the rest of the verse so well. We know the whole, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Most churches preach on that weekly. We don't necessarily, but maybe we should. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe. In this one portion of scripture we number one have this incredible blessing that is attached to tithe you wondering why you're not making out in the end of the month because you stole from God there is portions of your finances that was never yours to keep and I'm using the word keep but it's because it wasn't yours in the first place there are portions of your finances and we can talk for hours about, about the theology of tithing because no, necessarily the, the idea of tithing might not be repeated as a 10% in the New Testament, but the idea is repeated again and again and again because the principles of giving and giving a lot and giving uh, monthly is repeated again and again and again. And even Jesus, when the Pharisees, when he went to the Pharisees, he was speaking to them. Sorry, this is not up there, but I'm just thinking of it now. He went to the Pharisees and he said to them, but it's great, you know, you guys have been giving a tenth of your spices, your cumin, your this, your this. So he's saying you've been tithing, but you've neglected the important things of grace and, and mercy. And then what Jesus says is not, you shouldn't have given. He says, you should have not neglected the giving. Well, well, you should not neglect the giving, but you should also do the others. The principle stands. The principle stands. And it's in this principle that we are bringing curses upon our lives. I, I'm, I listen, hear my heart here. Hear my heart. I'm not trying to get a paycheck for myself. I'm not trying to, to get more money into the church. No. I'm trying to make sure that the enemy doesn't have a hold on yours. I'm not reading this because I'm, I'm hungry for finances. I'm reading this because you are sinking yourself. You're sinking yourself. Because you haven't planned your finances. You have an idea of about how much you get off to tax. And then at the end of the month, it's just a zero on all your accounts. And my heart breaks every month when I see people at the ATMs trying to pull more than they have. And I see it months. After months, after months. Plan your finances. And know that there is a portion of your finances that is to be given to his storehouse. Maybe we'll preach on tithing and the specifics around it some other time. Today, I want to warn you, if you want to set yourself up for success in your finances in 2021, even if you don't have any more than what you have now, you want that portion blessed. And the way to do that is to honor God by planning your finances and by giving to Him what is rightfully His. We've covered a lot of ground this morning, I know. 
And, and we have, 2020 is going out with a bang. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm diving in deep. But these simple principles, these simple things we've been talking about over the last two weeks, if you put them into place, if you would just simply put them into place, you are setting yourself up according to God's word for blessing. If you go this afternoon, you go to Excel, if you have a laptop, and you go to, you can get a budget, by the way, templates that's already there for you. It's in dollars, so you'll have to change it to rand. But, but you can, in, in 20 minutes, set yourself up a decent budget. I myself, just by the way, I, I update my budget monthly. I look at it again, and I make sure all my, my finances are right. Where is it going? Where, where is it not going? But if you would put these things into practice, if you would only make God your first priority, that, that means that you're going to anchor your hope of 2021 in Him, well, then you're setting yourself up for success. If you prioritize your family, and especially your husband and your wife, this is so important. People say, my family is a priority. I spent 20 minutes with my child this, this week. No, that's not what I'm talking about. If you would plan your finances, you're setting yourself up for success. So Lord, as we've, we've covered so much over these last two weeks, practical stuff, I pray that you would give us the strength to put it into motion. I pray that you would give us the strength to, to go from here and not just to hear the word, but to do the word. To be diligent in our finances to be honest and open and to give to you what is yours. I pray that we would prioritize you over everything in our lives and make our wives and children a priority. I pray that we will not just set ourselves up for success, but them. I thank you, Lord, that, that when these things start to fall into place, you promise blessing. So this morning, Lord, I'm standing before you with many other people who's one in heart. And we're saying, God, we're going to live right. We're going to do right. Because we don't want to walk a single day without you. And we don't want to go into 2021 without your blessing. And Lord, as we do this, I pray that you will start opening the floodgates of heaven over our lives that you would pour out so much that we would not have room enough to contain it. That we would be overflowing with your love, with your mercy, with your grace, with your blessing, with your giving, with your, your enablement to be, to be able to carry 2021 financially, emotionally, physically. I pray, Lord, that you would bless us as we put these things right in our lives. In Jesus' name.